Hello everybody and welcome to this recording which is designed to give beneficiaries a guide on how to complete the application form for the Key Action 107 2017 call for applications under Erasmus+. Plus. Please be aware that this recording is for UK applicants only. Before moving on to look at the actual nitty-gritty of filling in the application form, I'd like to give you an overview of the application process. So to summarise the application process, um, the only deadline for Key Action 1 in 2017 is the 2nd of February 2017 at 11am UK time. If you wish to apply for Erasmus Plus funding under this round, you will need to register on EU login and then log into the participant portal and register your organization on the unique registration facility or URF. Once you have completed these steps, you will then have your organization's participant identification code or PIC and you will need that PIC when you complete the e-form itself. For more information about uh, pre-registering before you fill in the application form, please see section C of the 2017 program guide. Please remember when you're filling in your application form that if there are any missing supporting documentation, so for example if you don't attach the Declaration of Honour which has been signed by the legal representative, then your application will be considered as ineligible. Also, if you are not an eligible organisation, your application will not be considered. And if you would like some more information about eligibility and whether or not your organisation is eligible to apply, please take a look at page 36 of the 2017 programme guide. If, after you've had a look at that page, you are still unsure um, and would like some more information, please do feel free to contact us. I provide the contact details for our help desk at the end of this recording. So on screen now in that first bullet point, you can see the link to the 2017 application form for Key Action 107 or International Credit Mobility as it is also known. I've also provided um, the link to a partner mandate in that second bullet point. So that partner mandate is a man mandatory annex for consortiums that are applying for funding and a partner mandate will be required to be attached to the application form for every single organization involved in that consortium. If um, an org a group of organizations is applying for funding as a consortium and fails to attach that partner mandate for each one of the organizations in that consortium, the application form will be considered ineligible. So I just wanted to show you now how and where to download the application form. I realized that the direct link was on the last slide, but I thought it would be useful to show you where it is on the actual website. So you need to go to this website here, apply for international credit mobility, and you can find that through this menu here. So it's menu, apply for funding, higher education funding, and then you click on apply for international credit mobility right there. So when you go to download the application form, you will need to follow this, this process. So you can see the application form under this section here, application e-forms. So you need to click that link, and then depending on your browser, you should see a box that says download. If you click show and folder like that, you'll see that the, the document is actually saved on the form in the, in the download section there. So you need to actually open the file from the download section to where it was automatically saved. I'd just like to show you, if you click just on this box, you do not click this arrow and show and folder, you just click that box you will be shown the error message that I've got on screen there. Um, so just make sure that when you are actually accessing that international credit mobility form, you go to the folder in which it was saved in order to open it, otherwise you will get this error message on screen. So now to just start looking at the actual details of the application form itself. So what you can see on screen now is the application form. Um, you can check in the top right hand corner what exactly you're applying for. So it should say Key Action 107, Higher Education, Student and Staff Mobility between Program and Partner Countries. So you can see here we've got section A and that's just general information and what that section gives you is an overview of the application form itself. 
And moving on to section B, you will see here that there are different fields and they are different colors. So just to let you know at the, from the start that when you have a gray field, um, so for example, program, key action, action, key, um, action type, call, round, and deadlines for submission, they're all gray fields. When they're gray, that means that you cannot edit these fields. They are fixed. Um, they're either fixed by a pre-populated field or they are dependent on information um, that you provided earlier in on the form. In this case, these are pre-populated fields. So for section B, the only section you need to fill in is the language that's used to fill in the form. These applications will be submitted to the UK National Agency. Our official language is English, and therefore you should be using English to fill in this form. Going forward, you have project identification. Um, so the start date for all Key Action 107 uh, 2017 projects is the 1st of June 2017. That is fixed and cannot be changed. However, your organization can choose whether you would like your project to be 16 or 26 months in duration. Depending on the duration you choose, the project end date here will automatically populate um, with a date. So if you choose the 20, uh, you choose the 16 month option, it will show the 30th of September 2018, and for the 26 months, it's the 31st of July 2019. So just give it some thought as to which duration you think would be beneficial for your organisation to have. You'll notice as well that this applicant organisation for legal name um, is is grey, which means that you can't type in it. The reason for that is that when you put your organisation's pick number in in the following fields that field will be populated i will show you that in a moment so um, when you're filling in the form don't worry about typing in this box because you won't be able to next you've got section b.2 national agency of the applicant organization as i said these um, forms will be submitted to the uk national agency so you should select uk01 and section C is the details of the applicant organization so these would be the details of the organization or consortium that is actually submitting the application form um, on behalf of the project so you will need to put your organization's pick number into this box and then you will need to click check pick so I've got a demo pick here so you can see that when you click that check pick all of these fields here under section C get filled in. Um, please note that this section here, the SEDEX field, um, that I believe only applies to French organisations. So if you're applying from a UK organisation, you will not be required to fill that field in. Um, where possible, if you could fill in the acronym, the department and the email address, that would be useful, but they are not mandatory fields. So I explained earlier that when you put your pick number in, you will have the full legal name showing in the previous section, and I'd just like to show you. So when you put the pick number in, you will be able to see your organization's name under section B. If any of the information shown um, in either the applicant organization full legal name or any of the fields in this section are incorrect, so that's under section C, applicant organization, you will need to log into your organization's participant portal, access the relevant PIC, and amend the information. We as the National Agency cannot amend any of these details for you, and you will need to log into the participant portal for that. Okay, the next section is C.1 profile. So at the top, you've got type of organization. Um, we're asking if it's applicable if you could put in a higher education institution tertiary level. It makes it a lot easier for us to evaluate statistics when we're looking at who is applying for this type of funding. And then you have these two questions underneath. So is your organization a public body and is your organization a non-profit? So you can see these boxes are greyed out, so you cannot type in them, they are pre-populated. Um, the answers to these questions are generated based on the information that you have input for your organization in the participant portal. If any of the details um, related to your organization in section C or section C.1 are incorrect, you will need to amend that via the participant portal. Next section, C.2 Consortium, are you applying on behalf of Consortium? So from the drop-down list, you just select yes or no. 
please bear in mind that the answer that you choose in response to that question, are you applying on behalf of a consortium, will affect the layout of the following question. So for example, if you select the answer no, you can see down in section C.3 accreditation, you will be asked for your higher education mobility consortium accreditation and you can type it in that accreditation reference box there if it does not automatically populate. It should in theory automatically populate but if not you can just type it in that box there. Um, if you click um, no in response to that question um, in section C.3 you will be asked for the details of your organization's Erasmus Charter for higher education. So in that box, the accreditation reference, your organization's Erasmus Plus ID should all automatically populate. If not, you can type it in. Um, but in the next section, so for C.4 and C.5, you will be asked for contact information for who we can speak to at your university about this project. So section C.4 is are the details of the legal representative, and the legal representative is an individual who has the authority to sign contracts on behalf of the university. So you just need to type these details in. The department section is optional, but if you know it, please do provide it. If the address for the legal representative is different to the organization, please click this box on the left-hand side there, and you will then be shown the option to type in the relevant address for the legal representative. Um, after that, you'll need to input the details of the contact person. The contact person for the project is usually um, a study abroad or Erasmus Plus coordinator and they are responsible for the managing of the Erasmus Plus project at the organization on a day-to-day -day basis. So this should be a person who works closely with the Erasmus Plus project and should be someone that we can uh, contact should there be an issue with the project. So please fill in all of the fields under this section. The department field um, isn't mandatory but if you know that information it would be useful to have. Again, if the address is different for the person, the contact person, and it's different to the organization, just tick that box on the left-hand side, and you can input the address for that individual. On these application forms, you can have a maximum of three contact people, so if you would like to add another contact person, you just click Add Contact Person, and then you will be shown the relevant fields like this. If you click that button in error, just click Remove Contact Person there. Please note that that button that says remove contact person will remove the latest um, entry for the contact person. So if you've input three contacts and you want to remove the second one, for example, if you click remove contact, it will remove the third and then you can remove the second. You cannot select which ones to remove first. Okay, moving on now to section D, main activities, which is a very important section of the form. Here you'll need to enter the different outgoing and incoming mobility activities for each of the partner countries with which you intend to cooperate. Please note that each set of mobility flows with a given partner country will be assessed separately. You can see at the top under section D, main activities, we have um, various links. Um, the we recommend that you take a look at both of these links, but one that you should definitely use is the um, distance calculator, which I'm highlighting for you now. So in the application form under section um, D.1, you will be asked for the distances between um, the destinations. And when you input that distance band, you can't use Google, you can't guess. You have to use that distance band calculator in that second link that I just highlighted for you. As I said before, you need to input all of the mobility activities for your entire organization. All of your mobility activities should be detailed on the one application form, and you cannot submit more than one application form. If you submit one application form and then submit another one at a later date, that second application will overwrite the first application form. So just make sure that um, you have all of the mobilities for your entire organization. So I'd like to start with showing you how to complete the student mobilities 
um, studies to and from partner countries. The the section, the table, sorry, for staff and students is slightly different, so I'll show you both. So you need to select whether it's incoming to the UK or outgoing from the UK. If you select incoming, the country of destination will be automatically populated. If you select outgoing, the country of origin will be automatically populated. You then need to choose, depending on whether it's incoming or outgoing, you would choose the country of origin or the country of destination. So in this case, I will select outgoing and I will need to choose the country of destination and I will do that as um, Cambodia. And um, let's say I've already checked the distance band on the European Commission's distance band calculator and it came out as um, 7,500 kilometers. I would choose that distance band there. Now the really important thing to remember when you're filling in this activities details table is that it is cumulative for the entire uh, the entire group of people that's going. So let's say for example um, you had 10 participants, 10 students who wanted to go for three months each. When I fill in this form I would multiply the total number of participants by the total um, duration for each participant and I'll show you what I mean now. So if I have 10 students going for three months I would not type three in there in this box and then type zero there because it would that would be too short when I divide the number of uh, the duration by the number of participants the, the mobility would be ineligible because the minimum duration is three months. So what you need to do is multiply that number of participants there by the total duration. So if I've got 10 participants going for three months each, the total duration would be 30 months. Please just bear in mind that the European Commission considers a month to be 30 days. So if you had, I don't know, 10 students who were going for a total of 30 months and um, 30 and a half months, for example, you will put 30 in the total duration, four months, and then the extra days, because it's half a month, and the European Commission considers a month to be 30 days, you would divide 30 in two, and therefore the number of extra days would be 15. If you have any questions about filling this um, section of the form in, please do let us know. It is very important that you get this correct. Um, so any questions, just let us know. Um, if you would like to add more uh, activities to that activity type, so you want to add more student mobilities, for example, you would click this plus arrow here, and you could then continue to populate the table. As so, again, I cannot stress um, the importance of using that distance band calculator enough. Um, so in this example, I'm going to say that I've got 20 participants and they would like to go for four months each. Therefore, I would multiply um, the number of participants by the duration each. So 20 multiplied by four months would make it 80 months. And there's no extra days, so I just put zero there. You can remove lines from this, the table for activities, by using the plus or minus button. Please note that if you click the minus button, it will... Um, delete the most recent addition to the table, um, so you just click that button there and then the most recent entry gets deleted. Unfortunately there is no way of selecting which one you delete, so if you have 10 entries and you want to delete the second one you'll have to delete all of them in order and then add them again. So say for example now you've added your students um, but you want to add a staff teaching mobility. To do that you would click the um, add activity button which is here at the bottom there and then underneath, sorry, above that, you will see um, the relevant table, which will be blank. So again, you select your activity type, which I do, I'll choose staff teaching. You can see here that the tables for student and staff are slightly different, so just bear that in mind when you're filling in the forms. Again, you, you will need to choose the incoming or outgoing, that is the same. So again, if you choose incoming, the country of destination will be automatically populated. If you choose outgoing, the country of origin will be automatically populated. In this case, I will choose incoming. Um, I will put the country of origin as Australia. And then I would select the relevant distance band as per the European Commission's distance band calculator. 
Now, with staff mobilities, the durations are five days to two months, um, and that doesn't include travel days. So with staff members, they can have a travel day for subsistence the day before they travel, the day before the activity starts, and also the day after the activity ends. So you can take that into account in the application form here. So generally speaking, you have, um, your, yeah, you'll have to put this information in in days. So you need to multiply, again, the number of participants by the number of days they would like to go for. So, so for example, if I've got um, six staff members and they would like to go for 15 days each, I would multiply the total number of participants, which is six, by the total duration, which excludes travel days, and that should work out as 90. But the important thing to remember here is that each, each individual, each participant for staff is entitled to their two travel days. So in addition to multiplying six by the total duration, you also need to allocate those two travel days to the participants. So as each staff member is entitled to two travel days, you would multiply the number of participants by two and input that in this total travel days box here. So you would take 6 and multiply it by 2, which gives you 12. And when you put that figure in, the grey box under total duration, including travel days, will automatically populate. Um, I've just realised, sorry, that I've made a slight mistake here. So what I fail to do, if you can notice, is I fail to multiply the total number of participants by the total duration excluding travel days. So as each staff member is going for six days, I need to multiply six by 15, which is a total of 90 days, and type that information in that box. You will then see that this tool automatically adds the total duration excluding travel days and the total travel days in these columns here, and then it automatically populates in this grayed out section there. Again, if you'd like to add any another activity, so for example, I've got student study and I've also got staff teaching, you can click add activity and then if you just go to the table, you can select, for example, staff training, and then you would fill in the table as, as before. Um, remember, if you add something in error, just click remove activity, and that will delete that. Um, it's important to remember as well that if you want to add more lines to this activity type, you can just click that plus button there, and it will add an extra line for you, as it did with the student form. So once you've filled in section D.1 activities details, the next section is section D.1.1, and it's a summary of the activities and participants per partner country. So this table will always be grayed out. You can't type in this table. If any of the information is incorrect, you need to go back to section D.1 um, activ activities details and amend the information there. This will show all of the information that you've input under Section D.1 Activities Details. Please do check this Section D.1.1 to ensure that the information that you have put in is, is correct. Once you've reviewed that section and you're happy with the information that's shown, um, the next section will be Section E, which is Budget. And this budget will show a breakdown of the funding that has been calculated based on the information in section D.1, activities details. So this budget is broken down into travel, which is E.1, individual support, which is E.2, and also organizational support, which is E.3. There is a lot of information about the budget um, in the program guide. So, for example, um, if you would like more information um, about the travel grant, that is on page 48. And you can find some more information about um, the organizational support on page 51 of the 2017 program guide. So, please do take a look at these sections, so E.1, E.2, and E.3, to make sure that you're happy and you agree with this information. 
as I said, all of these details are populated based on D.1 activities details. So if any of this information is incorrect, you will need to go back to D.1 and amend those details. The final part of this budget is a budget summary which shows the grant amount um, per activity type. And at the bottom there in E.4.1 it shows you the project total grant. Again, you can see that all of these fields are grayed out which means that you cannot type directly into these fields. You will need to go back to section D.1 activity details in order to amend any of this information. Okay, so next is um, the quality questions. So these are the narrative questions against which your application form will be assessed. For each, each country that you have added in section D.1, let me show you. So for every country that's shown in this table here, I've only got Australia and Cambodia. For each one of those countries, I will have to answer a set of quality questions. Please note before you even look at these quality questions that this table under section D.1 activities details must be completed. If you do not complete that table, these quality questions will not show. Please also bear in mind that each one of these narrative questions has a text box with a maximum of 5,000 characters, including spaces. So try and be concise where possible. And to help you with completing these questions, the European Commission has created a do's and don'ts document um, which provides guidance on how to answer the questions. The link to that document will be included in the description under this video. I really stress that you take a look at that when you're completing, completing these quality questions. It's a really, really useful document. We the National Agency cannot you know, advise you on how to answer these questions. But that document, the do's and don'ts document from the European Commission is really useful. So if you're a bit stuck, have a look at that. So as I said, you will need to answer a set of four quality questions for each one of the partners that you have added. So here first, because I added Australia first, that's what's come up first. With regards to the pick for these partner organisations in partner countries, um, the pick field is there, but it's not mandatory. So if you know the pick for the organization, you can just type it in this box here. And if you know the name of, sorry, if you know the pick, it will automatically populate in the field to the right. However, as the pick that I've put in is not um, a real pick, it doesn't bring it up. If you, However, if I put in our demo pick that we used earlier, I will show you how it works. So you can see there when I put that pick or pick number in, it's automatically um, populated the name of the organization there. You'll notice that that's grayed out, and that's because the information provided comes from the participant portal. If you don't know the pick, that's not a problem. You just type the name um, in this box here and then you can proceed with uh, the application form. The PIC is not mandatory for organizations outside Europe at application stage, but it is essential before any mobilities take place. The reason for this is that you will need that PIC number to access any of the European Commission's tools, such as the mobility tool, etc., etc. So that really is mandatory. So, as I said, you've got four questions for each partner country that you add, and they will cover four different topics. So, the first question is the relevance of the strategy, and here you have to explain why the planned mobility is relevant to the internationalization strategies of the higher education organizations involved, and that includes both the program and partner country. You will need to justify the proposed type of mobility in relation to the higher education institution's priorities. The next section that you'll have to answer a question on is F.1.2, and that's the quality question, quality of the cooperation arrangement. So, in this section, if if you want, if applicable, you'll need to detail your previous experience of similar projects with higher education institutions in the partner country, 
and explain how for the plan mobility project responsibilities, roles and tasks will be defined in the international version of the inter-institutional agreement. So you'll need to comment on how this application builds and enhances an existing part any partnership exist any existing partnership arrangements with the organizations in the project. Um, with this question, we do ask you to provide any information about existing partnerships that you might have. However, if this is a new partnership that you have, that's absolutely fine. You know, please do um, continue to apply as usual. But instead of talking about the previous experience that you've got, you would talk about the plan that you will have with your partners to implement in the future. The next question is section F.1.3, and that's quality of project design and implementation. So in this section, you will need to present the different phases of the mobility project and summarize what both you and your partner organizations plan in terms of selection of participants, the support provided to them, and the recognition of their mobility period, in particular individuals from the partner countries. In this section, you will need to refer to specific methods of recognition. Please note that in this section, under the quality of project design and implementation, you must indicate how many students you plan to send and the level of uh, the students. So um, each, each um, region of the world will have its own rules, and some of these rules prevent students of undergraduate and master levels um, being sent out from UK organisations. There is more information in that in our written guidance and in the recorded webinar that we have, which provides an introduction to the call. You can also find a document which covers the different budget rules on the International Credit Mobility page of our website. So just bear in mind that when you're filling in this section, quality of the project design and implementation, you must indicate how many students you are sending out at each level and whether they are incoming or outgoing. You will also need to indicate the total duration for all participants. So as before in that um, table, you would need to take the number of students and multiply it by the duration for each student to get the cumulative amount. If you have any problems with that, just let us know and we will do our best to assist you. And then the final question that you'll have to answer um, for each country is impact and dissemination. So in this section, you'll need to comment on and explain on how the desired impact of the mobility project on the participants, beneficiaries, partner organizations, and at local, regional, and national levels. You also need to describe the measures which will be taken to disseminate the results of the mobility project at faculty and institution levels and where beyond and beyond where applicable in both the program and partner countries. So I didn't go into too much detail about how to answer those quality questions because as a national agency we're not allowed to provide that level of information. But please do take a look at that European Commission's do's and don'ts document. It is very, very useful indeed. Okay, so now you've filled in the quality questions for the first partner country. You need to do it again for each one of the countries that you added in section D.1. So I've just provided the information for Australia and now I need to do it again for Cambodia. So again, the same rule applies. If I have a pick for the organization in Cambodia, I would put that in this pick box here and then it would automatically populate the name here. Um, however, I don't know the pick in this circumstance, so I'm just going to type some dummy information. And you would then need to fill in um, the set of four quality questions again for the organization in Cambodia. I won't go through it again, as we've already done it um, under the previous section. But yeah, important to remember that for every country you add, you have to answer a set of quality questions, and each one of those quality each set of those quality questions, sorry, will be assessed separately. Okay, so the next section of the application form is section G, which is the checklist. I won't go through this in too much detail because you can read through this when you're filling in the application form. But effectively, before you submit the application form, you should make sure that it fills all of the requirements shown in this checklist. 
Uh, we as the national agency do not need to see a copy of this checklist, so you don't need to email it to us or post it to us. This checklist is simply for your own information. Next up is Section H, the Data Protection Notice, um, and both, well, the applicant organization, whoever's filling in the form, and the legal representative will be required to read the Data Protection Notice in advance of signing the Declaration of Honor. So just make sure that, that, is, that the information in that Data Protection Notice is communicated clearly to the legal representative before they sign the Declaration of Honor. Section I is the Declaration of Honour itself. So the Declaration of Honour consists of two pages. The first page here shows an overview of exactly what you are agreeing to by signing this document. And then the second page is the section we need to be attached. So this section shown on screen is a section that will need to be printed off and actually completed by the legal representative. It will then need to be attached as an annex. You can print the Declaration of Honour by clicking that button highlighted in yellow there. So the Declaration of Honour is effectively um, your organization statement that all information in the application is correct to the best of your knowledge. There is no conflict of interest and you will take part in dissemination and exploitation activities if required. By signing the Declaration of Honour, this expresses a commitment to the activities you have outlined in your application, so it's really important that the uh, legal representative understands what they're signing um, when they're provided with that. Oh, please note as well that with this Declaration of Honour, all of this has to be completed by hand, so you can't type it in or put use an electronic signature. It needs to be an, uh, an original wet signature from the legal representative as stipulated earlier on in the legal representative section of the application form. The next section is section J which is the annexes. So this section allows up to a maximum of 10 annexes with a total of 240 kilobytes each. The only mandatory um, annexes are for well, for organizations that are applying um, just as a single university, they're not applying as part of a consortium. The only mandatory annex is the Declaration of Honor as signed by the legal representative. If you are applying as part of a consortium, you would need to attach a Declaration of Honor signed by the legal representative and also a partner mandate for every single one of the organizations within that consortium. To add a document, you just click the Add button on this right-hand side, and then you select the document from your computer, and, and then it will upload. Okay, and Section K is the final section, and that's the submission section of the actual application form. So the first section is K.1, the data validation. Now, there is, you can see here, you've got this um, this validate button and you can see that you've got a validate button here and indeed you will have a validate button at the bottom of every single page so you can validate this form at any point throughout throughout the form if you validate it and everything's okay it will say the form is valid if you validate it and there's an issue it will take you to where the problem is so I think there's I missed out some information if I click validate you can see here I'm showing a box saying this field is mandatory if I click OK, it will take me to the box that I need to fill in there. So I'm obviously just putting dummy information in, but you should put the relevant information for your organization. So do it for every single box. Do it, yeah, do it for every single section that you haven't completed. You'll need to fill in those, form, those, those sections. And make sure that it says the form is valid before you actually submit the form itself. So when you've completed all of the section, I'll show you what I mean. If you click validate now, it will show you a button saying the form, the form is valid. When you see that message, you can then continue with the um, submission of your application form. But please do make sure that you attach that, any mandatory annexes as I described before, um, before you click submit online. So the next section is the actual submission. So you should only submit your application form when you are happy with the finalized version. And in order to submit the application form, you will need to ensure that your computer is connected to the internet. 
Um, this is an e-form and it's all done online. So while you can fill in the form offline, to submit it, you will need to be connected to the internet. So before you should ensure all sections of the form are valid and all annexes are attached before submitting the form. We as the, National, the UK National Agency do advise saving the completed version of the e-form on your computer in case of any issues with submission. When you click Submit, if you click this Submit Online button here, the submission will be reflected in the submission summary. So when you've su successfully submitted, it will show that information in this sec in section K.4 Submission Summary. Again, if you try and submit and there are any errors with the submission at all, it will describe that error under section K.4 Submission Summary. For more information about the type of errors um, that you may encounter, please do take a look at the written guidance that we've produced and a link to that will be provided at the bottom of the video in the description section. Um, we do have um, an alternative submission procedure and this is only applicable to applicants that are unable to submit their application online due to a technical error. As I said, there is an entire process for this and there are a number of errors that we cannot accept as technical issues. So if you bump into a technical error, please do take a look at our written guidance. It's on page 25 and 26 of our written guidance. That will outline the alternative submission procedure so you can identify whether or not you will be eligible for that um, and also see whether the error you have been shown on screen would be something that we can, would consider as part of the alternative submission procedure. So once you, I won't submit this online um, because obviously this isn't um, an eligible application form from an organization, but to submit online you just press that button that says submit online. You will see a summary of the submission in K.4 submission summary and we do recommend that you print the form using that print form button at the bottom. So now we'd like, we've looked at the application form, I'd like to conclude this recording and I'd like to do so by reminding you of the support the UK National Agency um, will be offering in the run-up to the deadline on the 2nd of February 2017. We have the application form available on our website. We also have written guidance available on our website. We've got this recording um, which shows how to fill in the application form and we've also got a recording that goes through the background to the call so that will talk about eligible activities, um, budgets, etc, etc. We are also running question and answer webinars. The dates for that have not yet been announced but we will publish that on the International Credit Mobility website that you can see online there with that link at the bottom. However, the, the, the support that we provide isn't the end of it, so we do have a help desk and I'll provide the details for that at the end. And if you have any questions about the application form, just give us a call and we'll, we'll endeavour to answer them for you. Please note that that deadline of the 2nd of February 2017 will be busy because it's key action one across um, the board, so for all kind of higher education institutions will be applying for all key action one activities. Um, we do get very busy around that time, so please do contact us as far in advance as you can. I provided as well a slide of useful documents and these links are provided in the description of this video um, below. So you can see there and uh, uh, under the, th under the third bullet point, I think it's the third bullet point, yeah, fourth bullet point, that the, you've got the European Commission's do's and don'ts document there. I mean, I would say that all of these documents are very useful, but probably the most useful one for filling in the actual narrative questions is that do's and don'ts section, so I really recommend that you have a look. As promised, here are the contact details for the Higher Education Erasmus Plus Help Desk. The phone line is available from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday to Friday and you can also drop us an email at erasmus at britishcouncil.org. I suppose all that remains to say is thank you very much for your attention and best of luck with your application. Please do remember if you have any questions that aren't answered in the program guide, in our guidance or in our video recordings, you can just contact us for clarification. Thank you. <laughs>